Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we'll have time to address these questions once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Alice Mitchell. Uh, Alice is a junior professor at the Institute for African Studies of the University of Cologne. She's interested in the diversity of ways in which humans use language to mediate their relationships with others, particularly at the fine-grained level of everyday interaction. Her research, the data, has mostly focused on language uh, and social relations among the Togo speakers of Tanzania, with whom she has conducted almost two years of linguistic and ethnographic fieldwork. Her current project, uh, project explores how the Togo speaking children are socialized into kinship relations through everyday linguistic and bodily practice. Please join me in welcoming Alice as she gives her talk, Social Linguistic Language Documentation in the Rift Valley, Current Practices and Future Prospects. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you all for attending on um, during, during the lockdown period. Uh, so, um, by way of introduction, I just wanted to give you all a little bit of background about my own experiences with language documentation and some caveats. Um, I'm no longer, no, by no means an expert in the art of language documentation, but I have spent a, a great deal of time collecting linguistic data, thinking about how best to collect good data for my specific research projects, um, and transcribing and creating metadata for my recordings. Um, and I also have quite a bit of um, graduate training in language documentation from my time at SOAS and the University at Buffalo. So my, um, my Work so far has focused on the Togo communicative practices. Specifically, I've been working on documenting an elaborate avoidance register um, used in several varieties of the Togo. And I've also been building um, an audio video corpus of spontaneous everyday interaction in domestic settings. And along the way, I've collected um, a lot of other kinds of speech genres too. So it's, it's apparent from, from what I've just said that I'm an academic linguist. I collect linguistic data because I'm interested in studying language from a scholarly perspective. And I've not yet engaged in any kind of targeted community-based language documentation. Um, though I would say, you know, language documentation is always by definition collaborative. The people that I work with in my research have ideas about what kinds of data I should be collecting. You know, even children have ideas about what things might be important to document. So that's, that's influenced my work. Um, so, you know, although so far my, my data collection efforts have really been for my um, own scholarly purposes, I would say the data I'm collecting, you know, I believe it's gonna be valuable to other people at some point in the future. And I, I hope to make it available um, at some point. I've only archived a tiny portion of my recordings so far um, for various reasons that uh, we can we can talk about later on. So now you know a little bit more about where I'm coming from. Uh, I wanted to begin this talk by reminding us all of some of the general ideas behind the concept of language documentation um, before I then talk about sociolinguistic language documentation in particular. Um, most of us are probably extremely familiar with the field of language documentation. Many of us probably consider ourselves as working within this subfield. So I'll, I'll kind of just do a very brief recap. Um, Himmelmann's 1998 paper in the journal Linguistics is seen as one of the first major articulations of what language documentation is, uh, where he distinguished this activity from language description. And he argues that this, this distinction is important, that we should think about language documentation in its own terms um, to get linguists to, to pay more attention to um, the collection of primary linguistic data, where otherwise they might tend to focus on the more descriptive or analytical side of their work. Um, and in this article, Himmelmann characterizes the aim of language documentation as to provide a comprehensive record of the linguistic practices characteristic of a given speech community. And note that already in this definition, he uses the notion practices, i.e. what people do with language is, is, is important here. Um, he also talks about important resources like collecting elicited data and, and metadata as important components of language documentation. Um, 
I also have a very concise definition of what language documentation is from, from Tony Woodbury here, the creation, annotation, preservation and dissemination of transparent records of a language. Um, so, so why document languages? Well, there are several main justifications usually, usually given for why language documentation is worth doing. First of all, one reason has to do with the preservation and archiving of linguistic knowledge. Um, documentary corpora are ideally permanent records of language as it was used in a particular time in a particular place. And with respect to preservation, the development of documentary linguistics as a subfield is closely related to increasing concerns emerging in the 1990s about the high rates of language endangerment around the world. Um, and one of the main um, documentation funding bodies the Endangered Languages Documentation Program at SOAS explicitly is connecting these two things. Um, you know, it only, only documents work for varieties that can be shown to be disappearing. However, you know, preservation of linguistic material through language documentation shouldn't only be restricted to varieties that are threatening. Um, you know, preservation of any kind of linguistic material is incredibly valuable if we think about you know, historical records of the English language um, as it was spoken in previous centuries. That kind of data is of huge interest to many different kinds of people, not just linguists, but historians, artists, poets, and so on. A second reason that's very often um, given that motivates language documentation can fall under the heading of scientific scrutiny or accountability. So there's a push across the whole social sciences towards greater research transparency, more people are publishing their data sets, allowing other researchers access to primary data so that results and claims can be checked by others. And many linguists are keen to encourage this approach in our professional communities too. So that's, that's part of um, the push behind language documentation. And uh, Bradley McDonnell et al in their recent edited volume, Reflections on Language Documentation, um, talk about how language documentation is playing a crucial role here in changing scientific practices across linguistics. And uh, I'll let you read that quote yourselves. Uh, a third and related reason for doing language documentation is the major potential benefits of data sharing, both for academic as well as non-academic or local communities. Um, so data sharing is useful, not just in terms of being able to scrutinize someone else's analysis but but also for producing other kinds of research so as any of us who've done field work know collecting transcribing linguistic resources is hugely time consuming um, the resources that we do produce become much more valuable if we share them um, so language documentation uh, one of the benefits is that it enables more research allows people to ask different questions of the same data um, and also allows people who you know can't do field work for some reason um, to work on lesser documented languages. As for the local communities themselves, um, it kind of goes without saying that being able to um, watch videos, hear people speaking their language, um, engage in particular communicative practices is, is very valuable. And I think in Tanzania, we're seeing increasing interest in cultural heritage. Um, to be a little bit cynical, I think that's partly driven by the tourism sector, but also um, as a result of communities perhaps coming a little bit more similar. Um, there's increasing interest in cultural diversity and cultural traditions and so on. So I think those of us who are doing documentary work in Tanzania, it's important to think about what kinds of resources might be interesting for local people, um, not only now, but in the, in the future. Uh, very often that's not going to be verbal paradigms or adjective or morphology, but it's going to be community practices, ways of speaking or literature, songs and so on. So that brings us to the topic of sociolinguistic language documentation. Um, one of the main criticisms of language documentation or documentary linguistics has been the way in which it typically takes language as its central object, where language is often represented as a kind of monolithic, homogenous, bounded entity that we can somehow comprehensively capture through text and audio. Um, even in Himmelmann's 1998 paper, he does preempt this particular criticism. He tries to emphasize that language documentation should be about communicative practice, 
rather than about you know an abstract linguistic system and i think in theory we kind of all recognize this point but our activities don't necessarily reflect this and the kinds of recordings we make don't necessarily reflect this um, so this is where the idea of sociolinguistic language documentation comes in um, so the, the term as I'm using it comes from a paper by Tucker, Childs, Jeff Good and myself um, from 2014. I was a research assistant um, on a project um, that Tucker and Jeff were involved in at the time. And um, in that paper, we emphasize the point that the focus on single languages and on what Woodbury has called ancestral codes, i.e. Um, the idea of language is these kind of traditional objects that belong to communities. We tried to try to argue that's very problematic and especially so in African contexts where um, communi communities are typically highly dynamic, multilingualism is the norm for, for most people, um, and where there's a rapid change in communicative systems through processes of contact. So whether that's through, you know, migration, urbanization, displacement, there's all kinds of interesting communicative practices going on that wouldn't necessarily fall under the rubric of an ancestral code, but are nonetheless interesting to document. So um, the Childs et al. paper tries to kind of elaborate this concept of sociolinguistic language documentation. What would that look like? And it's based on discussions that took place at a workshop organized by Jeff and Tucker um, held in Buea, Cameroon in the summer of 2012. So it really has um, an Africanist focus. Um, so I just, I just wanted to outline some of the kind of central themes in, in the Childs et al. paper, and then we can start thinking about how they might apply um, in the context of the Tanzanian Rift Valley. So perhaps the main kind of intervention, as it were, is that a sociolinguistic language documentation focuses on linguistic repertoires rather than single languages, um, particularly multilingual repertoires. Um, another way of thinking about it is that our, our objective in, in sociolinguistic language documentation is um, documenting patterns of use rather than linguistic forms. Um, another thing that's emphasized in the paper is collecting data in as wide a range of contexts as possible. And um, we put particular emphasis on spontaneous conversation as a really, really rich um, speech genre and one that's you know happening all the time. So this point isn't really new. I mean, Himmerman also said, you know, we need to we need to document as many different con contexts as possible. But nonetheless, language documentation still tend to focus on sort of narrative text, procedural texts, essentially elicited data. Um, another point in the Charles et al. paper is um, creating data or thinking about creating data that's useful for multiple disciplines, um, not just for, for descriptive linguistics, but um, you know, for sociolinguistics, for anthropology, for, for discourse analysis, that's actually, again, a, a quote from Himmelman. Um, and we also put special emphasis on creating useful data for applied linguistics um, as an important research area for many African scholars. So the question then is what kinds of um, language data are useful for policy, language policy and language planning, um, for instance? Um, so, you know, thinking about our current situation, right, um, data collected in the context of language documentation could potentially inform the way health organizations um, communicate information about hygiene in the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, and then another kind of emphasis on, this, on the sociolinguistic side of language documentation is what, what metadata would look like. And, um, the point here was that, you know, compared to traditional documentation, sociolinguistic language documentation would have really ethnographically informed metadata. So you'd have much more extensive information about, for example, how people are related, the kinds of social relations, relations that hold between different speakers, kin relations, joking relations, professional relationships, and so on. Um, and in general, sociolinguistic language documentation is going to benefit massively from having a good ethnographic handle on, um, on the particular place language documentation is being carried out, which I'll talk about later. So just trying to sum this up, 
uh, as concisely as possible. I've come up with a very green schematic um, indicating some of the differences between a so-called traditional approach to documentation and a more sociolinguistically oriented approach. Um, so first of all, we can, we can distinguish the target object of documentation. Um, on, on one end of the scale, the target would be a kind of single shared code. On the other end of the scale, it would be a linguistic ecology and the diverse communicative practices that make up that ecology. Um, second, we can differentiate between the, the kinds of language use that are captured in documentary work from elicited or more controlled kinds of language use to spontaneous language that's embedded in, in real um, or at least more natural cultural context. And then third, we can distinguish the intended purpose of the documentation. Um, so on one end of the scale, documentation for grammatical description, and on the other, documentation that can also be useful for anthropological, sociolinguistic or applied linguistic research. Um, so I want to think about these different dimensions of language documentation and their relevance to our work in the Tanzanian Rift Valley. Um, so if we think about what, what kinds of audiovisual documentary materials already exist for Rift Valley languages, um, I'd like to single out Andrew Harvey and Richard Briscombe's wonderfully rich and impressively large audiovisual documentary corpora of Gorwa and Asinje Datoga, respectively. Uh, both of these are accessible online at the SOAS Endangered Languages Archive. And then, as I was preparing this talk, I got quite sucked into these corpora. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to, to go have a look at what's in them, really, really fascinating stuff. And Andrew and Richard are currently working on documenting several other languages of the Rift Valley. So um, that's, that's very exciting for all of us. There's also a lot of other documentary material out there that's harder to um, access either because it's on people's hard drives or in text form, um, not yet widely available, often for good reasons, but um, that's a point I'll come to right at the end of the talk, perhaps something we can usefully discuss together, accessibility. Um, we also have access to lots of secondary outputs of language documentation, so dictionaries, grammars of various languages, um, and that can, you know, that can contribute to sociolinguistic research, though it's not going to be um, you know, the most useful kind of data. Okay, so thinking about the, the first continuum or scale from my, from my earlier slides, so where we're kind of focusing on codes versus practices and ecologies, I think it's probably fair to say that documentary work in, in the region we're interested in has usually focused on single languages or codes. So, you know, my own, um, in my own case, I've concentrated on recording examples of two dialects of Datogo. And although my, you know, my, my documentary activities are very sociolinguistic on the one hand in that I focus on recording conversation and um, I've been documenting an avoidance register that's used by women, um, I do kind of mentally separate and practically separate what's Datogo from what's other languages. Um, so there are, there are various bits of Swahili and Iraku in, in my recordings. Um, but on the occasions where I've been um, recording in a household and someone starts up a conversation in Iraq, or someone else will say, oh no, you need to speak the Togo, right? And, and that's reasonable because that's based on, you know, the way that I've presented my work. Also, I would not be able to transcribe Iraq. Um, but the point is, you know, I'm constraining what I'm documenting um, by kind of singling out or drawing a line around the single, the single code. And that obviously has a lot to do with my research questions. Um, if I was interested, if I was working on multilingualism, then, then that would have looked quite different. Um, we've been talking about this quite a lot in, in our online meetings about language contact um, in the Rift Valley. And you know, there's increasing amounts of research being, being done on this topic. Um, network members such as Amani Lusekelo have published quite a lot of work on lexical borrowing, other aspects of language contact. But at the moment, we don't have a great deal of primary data on actual everyday linguistic practice um, with which we could study contact processes. So that's something that might be really interesting to focus on in the future. Um, if, yeah, if we're interested in topics like language shift or language oppression, as it's recently um, been referred to, we might want to pay a lot more attention to the influence of Swahili, potentially other languages, 
um, in various communities. So I think probably all of us who've recorded, um, have, you know, been making, making documentary materials, there will, will be, Swahili will be in them somewhere, right? So it's kind of an interesting question to, to look at, at where that is. Um, so I just wanted to suggest, kind of throw up an idea here, an additional model for language documentation in the Rift Valley, one that's not based on a single language, but rather a place or, or a particular community. And one public setting that I'd be interested in looking at in future is the Imnada, so the, the large weekly or fortnightly markets um, as spaces where all kinds of different people are coming together, sharing ideas, speaking different languages, communicating with each other on the basis of potentially quite different communicative norms. Uh, and I think this might be a really interesting context in which to better understand the dynamics of language context uh, in the Rift Valley. Um, having said that, I think, you know, there's still, there's still good reasons why we do kind of code-based documentation, as it were. Um, and local communities might also find that the most meaningful or most appropriate way um, to, to, make, to make recordings of language. Um, even if we are doing code-based documentation, though, you know, there's still so much diversity there that we can capture, that we can try to capture. We should be thinking about things like you know, even sign languages, um, different dialects, different sociolects, capturing speech from all kinds of different speakers and speaker configurations. Um, and that brings me on to my, to this kind of second uh, continuum I was showing you where we can think about the context of language use that we're recording. And um, we can think about this in terms of more controlled to more spontaneous and, and obviously this is a continuum so on the more controlled side i've got what i'm calling linguist directed speech um, so that's things like elicitation sessions interviews procedural texts in the middle i've got oral literature or creative genres of language use like stories or songs or riddles and that can be i mean often these are recorded um, in a controlled fashion as kind of linguist directed narratives and so on um, but they can also be recorded in much more spontaneous, kind of culturally embedded ways too. Um, and on the more spontaneous side then, I've got what I'm calling informal language use. So we can, we can have a genre which we might call talk, um, as conversation analysts say, which includes, you know, all kinds of different speech practices. Um, we could think about things like child-directed speech, animal-directed speech, um, and those, I would say, in my own work, I've sort of been focusing on that general cluster. Then there's things like institutionalized or more ritualized speech. So the language, language and linguistic practices of meetings um, in classrooms related to particular occupational practices and religious practices um, and so on. Um, I should say that most of these me metapragmatic categories come from English. And the, uh, my own ideas were about what people do with language. And one really important thing about sociolinguistic language documentation is having metalinguistic discussions with relevant communities to find out how people talk about language use, how they conceptualize linguistic behavior, um, and then basing, basing documentation off of that, right? So like I might be interested in greetings and then I find out that um, people actually distinguish between three different kinds of greetings maybe they have even different verbs for them right so then i might think about how i can capture those differences so i, I just wanted to kind of hone in now on um several of these these areas and see kind of how we're getting on with um documenting these kinds of practices in the rift valley so um starting with oral literature um i think we're doing pretty well here um there is a lot of documentation out there that's not yet accessible, but there's also actually quite a lot that you can find online. So especially for Iraku, we have the Iraku Oral Literature Project on the Verba Africana website, which um, again, if you've not seen it, I'd encourage you to go have a look at. There's, um, there's also the ongoing Iraku Texts in Society Project that we heard about last year at the East Africa Day. Um, we've also got a book of Iraku Texts that were collected almost a century ago. Um, if you go on to Richard and, and Andrew's corpora on the ELA um, website, there's all kinds, of, all kinds of interesting stuff in there, songs and riddles and so on. Um, and another interesting aspect of this, from my own experience, is a lot of community internal 
documentation of songs and dancing going on that are shared by mobile phone. Um, I'm not sure to what extent it's posted kind of online, but you can find some stuff on YouTube and Facebook, um, which is quite interesting. And uh, just honing in on one particular genre, we actually have quite a lot of information out there about riddles in the Rift Valley. So um, Martin Maus has a paper in which he documents 160 Yuraku riddles. Um, the Gordwa corpus has quite a lot too. There's some published work on Sandawe riddles. So this might actually be, um, might kind of have uh, some potential for an interesting collaborative project um, using existing documentary materials, looking at the, uh, the tradition and art of riddle telling in different communities. So literary genres, songs, music, that kind of thing, are usually very salient expressions of cultural identity. Community members are keen to document, like they are documenting. Um, and um, yeah, so that kind of thing you usually find in language documentation projects. I think there's a, a, a quite a lot less interest, um, perhaps especially among community members in recording daily mundane conversation. Um, and that might partly explain why we find much less of this kind of genre in documentary work. Um, although there are other reasons why that is, you know, it can be technically challenging to, to record uh, conversation, transcribing it is also quite labor intensive. Um, in my own research on Datoga, documenting spontaneous conversation has been my main focus. And um, I would say, I mean, that choice has been completely guided by my own research interest, but over, uh, over the years, I've seen how incredibly useful that data is for answering all kinds of different questions. So I'd really um, try and emphasize the importance of collecting conversational data, not only for linguistics, but also for, for anthropology in terms of looking at the kinds of discussions people are having on an everyday basis, um, the way they're using particular concepts and so on. And of course, you know, even if you're making a dictionary, conversational data can be extremely valuable for looking at frequency and, and nuances and meaning and so on. Um, so if, you're, if you are a community member, then obviously you have uh, quite easy access to recording conversation. For outsider researchers, it can be a little bit more difficult. Um, and in my case, I would say that um, participant observation, so, so living with people, participating as fully as possible in their lives, makes it a lot, a lot easier to capture spontaneous conversation. Um, and yeah, so basically becoming a kind of quasi household member. So that's uh, another benefit of, of more ethnographic approaches to language documentation, um, which um, I'll come on to uh, now. So I just, in the kind of final couple of slides, I just wanted to bring up a range of different points that I think we might want to consider um, as we plan sociolinguistic language documentation for the future. Uh, and this is kind of a, a bit of a grab bag of different, different ideas. Um, so as I, as I was just saying, I think ethnographic methods are hugely beneficial in documentary projects. Um, ethnography is not something we're typically taught as linguists, but in-depth ethnographic research within a given community can produce a great deal of knowledge about how language use is understood locally, what important genres of communication might be, um, how language use differs, um, and it can also, you know, help us actually understand what what does you know what does language how is language conceptualized what does what would it mean. Um, to try and document language from the perspective of, um, of, the, of, of local people. Um, so this is something that Charles et al. emphasized in the 2014 paper is that, I mean, no language documentation can be done by an individual person to begin with, but sociolinguistic language documentation perhaps has even greater need to be kind of interdisciplinary and team-based. Um, so a particularly good combination here would be ethnographers, anthropologists, and linguists, and, but of course there's many other people who are potentially very useful. Um, there's been lots of successful projects with ethnomusicologists and ethnobotanists and so on. Um, there's also a, a growing impulse to make documentary project, projects collaborative and community-led as far as possible. Um, Andrew and Richard have, have uh, a lot of experience with this and I, I really hope We'll get to hear about um, how their work's been going sometime soon. 
Um, I think one thing that's going to be really important for, for producing useful sociolinguistic language documentation is, is more emphasis on local understandings of language um, that can help guide documentary efforts. And I also have been wondering about the possibilities of citizen science or people powered approaches to sociolinguistic language documentation. So I know Richard's collaborators have been using mobile phones quite effectively in their work. Uh, I think there's lots of innovation going on around the world um, and using mobile phones to collect linguistic and metalinguistic data. Stephen Bird's done quite a lot of work on this and um, has even developed an app that could potentially be useful. I'm not sure if it's restricted to a certain part of the world or whether that can be widely used. Um, something I've not yet mentioned in my talk today, uh, but which is a central aspect of any documentation work or indeed any research at all, is the ethical side of things. Um, I think there's a lot of difficult issues for us to think about and, and um, you know, I, I completely including myself in this. So first of all, you know, who does language data belong to? Um, what does community mean in different Tanzanian contexts? I think we have to be wary of making assumptions about the notion of community and linking it too strongly with language. Um, that again goes back to these kind of ethnographic questions about how is language conceptualized? Is it something that belongs to people or you know, is there some other, other way of understanding language? Um, another ethical issue which um, deserves our attention is the possible colonial overtones of documentary research. I think we, and I you know, very much include myself, need to think more carefully about the historical context of data gathering and resource extraction among marginalized people, um, as well as the ways in which colonialism has shaped our own research. You know, and I say that as a British person, right, doing research in Tanzania. Um, as a counterweight to that, we should, we should be thinking about decolonial approaches to language documentation. I'd really recommend um, Leonard 2018 for a short piece on that topic. And then finally, um, from my grab bag of ideas here, um, is the question of how we make documentary resources accessible. So all this sociolinguistic language documentation is great, but ultimately, you know, only of limited use if we don't share it. Some of us have used institutional archives. Um, that's a great option, but it can be very expensive. It's also often restricted in certain ways. Um, so I just wanted to kind of raise the question whether some kind of communal archive might be something we can think about as a network. Would this, actually, would this be useful would be the first question, um, somehow pooling our resources. Um, what might this look like? What initial steps could we take towards such a project? I mean, we're already using Zenodo for, um, for storing, you know, the bibliography and these talks and, you know, that would be a very simple way to start um, sharing, sharing materials. Um, and another question would be, are there other historical resources out there that could be made more accessible and what kinds of infrastructure and skills would we need to do that? Um, so hopefully you all have some thoughts on, on, on these issues. I'll, um, I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, that's my list of references. And uh, yeah, see if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Um, so that will start off our question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, please use the chat module of Zoom. Uh, and just so everyone has some time to write. Um, maybe I don't so much have a question, but at least I think it's, you bring really interesting points, um, both on the nature of collecting data and how to go about it, but also about sharing the data with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and like you, I've also been thinking about a shared archive for this network, which could be really helpful um, just to share the data that we have, the older resources that might be stuck in certain libraries. But it's always yeah. so hard to know who owns the data and if we're allowed to share it, which is at least something I struggle with. Yeah, 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 that's a really difficult question. I mean, I suppose with so um, Historical resources, I guess it's it's almost impossible to know, right? Yeah. Um, with our own recordings, I mean, the, I feel like consent to share recordings is, is, a, is a continual process, right? Um, and that's what makes it so difficult because um, people can change their minds or people, you know, 
learn more about how these resources are being used. Um, so, you know, that's, I mean, institutional archives have to deal with, with those difficult questions and, you know, you can put various restriction, access restrictions on things which um, wouldn't probably be possible in our, in our little small scale sharing enterprise if we were to, to do one. Um, I mean, in my case, you know, I have recordings of conversation that is personal. It's, it's, I mean, it's really like everyday mundane topics in general. I was thinking, you know, at the very least sharing the, the text data is useful to other people. Um, even if, you know, parts of it are redacted and anonymized. The other thing is, we don't always want to anonymize our data, right? I mean, a lot of people are proud to be involved in this work and they, and they would rather have their name um, included. So yeah, there's, it's, it is a bit of a minefield um, and something that, you know, is very useful to share, share opinions on. Yeah, it's good to think about. Um, I see a comment from Richard, so I'll just read it out. Uh, he says, thanks, Alice, for this very insightful talk. Do you have any ideas about overcoming the issue of informed consent when moving towards documentation of spontaneous speech, especially in public spaces in the NADA, the market setting that you mentioned, for example, what approach would you suggest for capturing the language ecology of the market environment while still informing participants that they're being recorded for research purposes? Will we always be uh, restricted to small size ecologies when it comes to spontaneous speech because of this ethical obstacle? Yeah, thank you, Richard. I think, so, um, very good question. Obviously, a very complicated issue. In, in this case, I think there's, um, there's a very important role for participant observation here. So let's say I spend a month just, just um, hanging out with, well, maybe I'd even travel with the Mnada people, right? I don't even know how that works. Um, to the different places and I would just immerse myself in that environment. I wouldn't make any recordings. I would get to know people. I would build social relationships. Um, and I mean, this is obviously a long term, long term kind of investment, but over time you would hope that that you could build relationships such that you could then explain that you would like to make recordings um, that, you know, you'd know market trade as well enough that that would be okay that you'd have a a reasonably good way of explaining explaining that work then to um, people coming to buy stuff. Um, I think it can be done. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Coleman Donaldson. He's been making these really wonderful podcasts um, of um, I think some Manding languages in West Africa, and he's been recording them. These interviews with people at markets, and they're they're so fantastic. Uh, I assume in his case, he gets permission from, you know, the small, the small group of people um, beforehand in each case. Whether what your point about the small size ecologies, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess we would be stuck. I mean, in, in the UK, you can make recordings in public settings, right, legally. I don't know about Tanzania. Um, but yeah, without kind of getting consent from thousands of people. <laughs> <laughs> but also there's the transcription point, right? So small, maybe small size ecologies is where we want to begin anyway. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to a question from Marta. He says, uh, I need some more tips on how to get natural conversation. I have asked my research partner, Basilis Ahoa, to record uh, conversations. She has done some, but she finds it difficult. She needs permission beforehand. Um, people are hesitant and indeed find it less important. So he's a bit stuck in getting better natural speech. Mm, yeah, thank you, Martin. That is, um, it is tricky. And I was actually thinking when I was saying that, that, that local people might, um, it might be easy for them. In some ways, it might actually be harder. Um, because so like, let's say I, I'm living with my Datoga family. And, you know, we, we eat together every evening, and I put the video recorder on. And uh, yeah, it's like, I mean, I'm sort of slightly irrelevant because, <laughs> because I'm not an immediate family member. So maybe in some ways it's easier for me as an outsider. Um, tips, I think just keep trying. So don't expect you're gonna get great data, you know, the first, second, third time. Um, maybe try and set up some kind of regular thing. Also, um, 
leaving the camera on for quite a long stretch of time. So like maybe people are a bit funny in the first 15 minutes, though normally in my case, it's even shorter than that. And then more natural conversation will come later. Um, and I guess the other thing is, you know, if you're asking people, right, I need you to have a conversation, that's obviously not natural. So it's about seeking out places that you can be legitimately anyway, um, regularly, and, you know, like a meal time, for example. And then and maybe, maybe in that context, your collaborator would, would um, have better, better luck. Um, so regularity and also sort of familiarity, some normal context, the conversation happens anyway. Thank you for those very helpful tips. I think those are useful for everyone. Um, not seeing any more comments at the moment. So I'll just say something of my own. I think you mentioned that you saw some of the younger people sharing videos themselves using mm. mobile phones. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate a bit? Yeah. Um, so this was uh, while I was doing field work in, in Eshkesh um, with the Torah speakers. And uh, often, so um, people have, there aren't many smartphones, but people have kind of those old school phones that you can still watch videos on. Um, and then you'd have the, the memory card, right? Which is an extremely valuable object to have. And uh, people would share these memory cards and there would be short clips of, um, the toga dances, so um, yeah, dances and songs, and often they were actually from quite far away. Uh, so I think there was one I remember watching. Um, I think there were, the, there were the toga people who lived like in Tango or something, and uh, th this kind of elicited a, an interesting discussion about how they looked different and how their traditions had already kind of changed. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is obviously not like formal language documentation but in a way right that's that is documentation in that cultural context oh i see martin has written something interesting <laughs> yeah so martin has written shall we do in verba africana chapter on rift valley riddles together which is an invitation to everyone involved yes let's do it well that already gives us something to think about for the future which is really nice um, yeah I also think that we'll conclude the question and comment section because I don't see anything else coming up. Yeah. Um, so thank you everyone for the questions and comments of today. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, April 22nd by Amani Dusikelo, and it's titled Linguistic Aspects of Names of Crops and Vegetation in Hatsabe. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Alice again for her presentation and of course everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.